my self introduction. My name is Michael. I'm the moderator for today's. I'd like to give floor to Professor Boris. He's from Netherlands, the first country in the world to recognize the same co sex couple marriage. Well, Michael, thank you so much for having me. It's really my honor to be uh, in your presence and to talk a little bit uh, about two things, actually. First, I would like to give, an, let's say, an overview about the Dutch same-sex marriage law and the history a little bit. And then I will focus on parental rights, because that's actually the topic of today's uh, meeting. But now let me go back to uh, the 1st of April, but then 20 years ago. Um, I think the significance of same-sex marriage in the Netherlands is that there is now a whole generation in the Netherlands of young people who grew up with the idea that love defines a marriage and not the gender of the two partners. So it doesn't matter if it's a man and a woman who are married or two men or two women. There's this whole generation of young people who find it um, completely unthinkable that there used to be discrimination uh, against same-sex couples in terms of marriage rights. Um, let me go back to um, the 90s in the Netherlands. Um, there were a lot of debates about equal rights of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, not so much transgender people, because in the 90s, so let's say 30 years ago, transgender people were relatively invisible in Dutch society. So it was more about gay rights. And uh, there was a lot of debate because in the 80s, we were confronted with AIDS and a lot of young gay men died because of AIDS. And at the time, I was a lawyer in Amsterdam and I defended several um, of the surviving partners of um, a young men who died from AIDS. And I noticed that they didn't have any rights. So it was very easy for the landlord to evict the um, surviving partner or for parents of the son who died to say, you have to leave the house within a few hours and all the stuff that's in the house is ours because we as parents inherit um, all the things that our uh, late son has left. And so that was very unfair. And I thought, at a time when I was a lawyer, um, I thought when I will be a politician, I really need to do something about that. And so in 1994, I was elected for the first time as member of parliament and during my campaign, which started in 1993, I was open about my sexual orientation. And I told the Dutch public that if they would vote for me, I would really try to uh, come up with solutions about um, the fact that gay couples, lesbian couples didn't have any rights. And so I was elected. Um, and in 1994, I proposed for the first time same-sex marriage in Dutch parliament. Um, and this was a very far-fetched idea actually because nowhere in the world same-sex marriages took place. So most people said to me, yeah, but it doesn't exist anywhere. So why would we want to be the first? Um, and it was very difficult because the uh, Dutch LGBT movement uh, came to me and said, we are so disappointed in you because now finally we have the first openly gay member of parliament who is talking about family rights, who is a lawyer and who could do stuff for us. And now he wants to open marriage, civil marriage to same-sex couples, they said, that's not what we want because we see marriage as an old fashioned heteronormative institution, which suppresses our lifestyle. And so they said to me, please focus on other issues. We don't support you. And that of course was very difficult for me because a lot of other members of parliament said, well, if your own community doesn't support same-sex marriage, why would we support it? So it was kind of difficult, but after 
I would say one or two years, they changed course uh, and, and a new board of the NGO, the LGBT NGO came forward and they said, okay, we will support you. Well, to make a long story short, in 1998, um, we started first with registered partnership because uh, at the time we still thought that same-sex marriage would not be feasible but we wanted to grant legal rights to same-sex couples so we started with a registered partnership law which is in effect almost the same as same-sex marriage except that of course the name is different and when you divorce, there's a big difference. A marriage, when you divorce, you have to go in the Netherlands, you have to go to the court and you have to ask the judge to dissolve your marriage. But when you have a registered partnership, you simply go to the municipality, to an official, and you declare that you want to break up your relationship, your uh, registered partnership, and that's it. So there was uh, this difference. And so the interesting thing was that when we introduced registered partnership in 1998, a lot of gay and lesbian couples went to the municipality to have their relationship uh, registered, but they didn't really know the difference between marriage or registered partnership. So when they went to the municipality with their parents and friends and family members, they came out and they said, yes, we are married, we are married. Of course, that was not the case, but it really helped uh, the Dutch public, the general public, to accept the fact that uh, it's about love, uh, marriage, and it's not about the gender of the two partners. And so uh, in 2001, uh, we introduced... Uh, marriage equality. I can talk a little bit more about that in detail, but let me skip that for now. But if there are questions about how it came about, then I can uh, talk a little bit um, more about that. Um, I should really emphasize that although we now have a marriage law, and the law is actually very simple, it, um, in, in our family law, it now says a marriage consists of two partners, could be opposite sex partners or same sex partners. And for the rest, the marriage legislation stayed the same as it was uh, before. So it was just a matter of fixing a few words in the family code of our uh, civil uh, code. Um, but what I wanted to say is that all, it, it's of course wonderful that we achieved this 20 years ago in 2001 when the first marriages took place. But it doesn't mean that discrimination in society against gays, lesbians, bisexual people, transgender people have stopped. No, it's not the case. Um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of issues uh, also in the Netherlands uh, that we need uh, to solve. Um, we have this very active LGBT community. There's this NGO. And um, last week we had our elections in the Netherlands, our national elections again. Um, and this NGO is, was very active. So uh, a few weeks before the elections, they drafted a list of things they wanted to achieve and they invited all major political parties to uh, come to this meeting and to sign a document in which um, um, those um, uh, political parties propose to solve these uh, issues that are still at hand and to come up with um, new legislation in order to strive for full equality without discrimination. Um, there are a few things on the list which are interesting, and then I will start focusing on parenthood. But on the list, uh, it says, for instance, that everybody in the Netherlands will be allowed to have the marker X in his or her passport instead of male or female. So you don't have to be categorized as male or female anymore, just uh, an X in the passport 
or other uh, identification documents will be enough. And um, also the political parties who signed on to this list, this wish list of the LGBT movement, they said, we will strive of, to eliminate asking somebody's gender uh, in official documents if it's not necessary for, for instance, medical reasons. Of course, sometimes when there is a public survey and the government wants to know if women might be um, prone to um, develop breast cancer, of course, then it's important to ask a person, are you male or female? But in a lot of cases, like if you want to have a driver's license, it's not relevant to know if you are male or female. So the, uh, the political parties now promised to um, uh, start uh, drafting legislation. But um, there are many other uh, topics on uh, the wish list uh, that these major political parties signed on. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have many political parties and usually three or four political parties will um, form a coalition government. And the idea is that this wish list will end up in the coalition contract. There's one uh, um, issue that I would like to highlight now uh, on this wish list, uh, and that's the focus on rainbow families. Like for instance, uh, Didi's story we heard in the beginning, <clears throat> that would be very relevant. According to uh, the Dutch definition, a rainbow family can consist of two women or two men or a combination of two couples, women and uh, female or male couples who are raising one or more children. Um, in the Netherlands, we have 17 million inhabitants and we don't know how many rainbow families there are. This is not uh, registered. So it's a little bit difficult, but according to NGOs uh, whom I contacted, one estimates there are about 10,000 or even more rainbow families at present. So this combination of parents who are raising uh, children. Um, up until now, according to Dutch law, a child can only have two legal parents. Usually, of course, that's a father and a mother, um, but um, we make a distinction in Dutch law between legal parenthood and custody rights. According to Dutch law, a child can have a maximum of two legal parents and two parents with custody rights. Often this is the case, um, for instance, when a divorce has taken place and when one of the legal parents remarries uh, or has a registered partnership with a new partner and then uh, the new partner can obtain uh, custody rights. Um, in situations of two women who are married, uh, the birth mother will always be the legal parent according to Dutch uh, legislation, and her wife can obtain legal parenthood only in the situation if there is no biological father in sight. Um, for instance, if there is an anonymous donor, sperm donor involved, or um, the women say they don't know who the father is. Uh, if the donor is a family friend, um, the other mother can only obtain custody rights, so no legal parenthood, unless, uh, there are always exceptions of course, unless the uh, biological father does not object uh, against the second mother becoming legal uh, parent, and then they need to sign a document and then um, the child can have two legal mothers. Um, when there are more grown-ups involved in raising children, uh, like a lesbian couple and a gay couple, and this happens quite often, and I know 
from uh, my own experience. There are uh, in my uh, vicinity uh, lesbian and gay couples raising uh, one or more children. So it's four uh, adults. Uh, then the legal situation becomes, of course, complex because there are some legal and financial problems at the moment, uh, according to Dutch legislation. Let me mention a few medical issues, uh, for instance, when you are the third or the fourth parent, you are not allowed to visit a doctor with your child and you cannot grant permission for a, me a medical procedure in relation to your child and you don't have access to the medical records of the child. This is when you are the third or the fourth parent. Uh, in educational matters, uh, there are schools who do not allow uh, the third or fourth parent to come to the school and get information about how the child is doing at school in information meetings, especially designed for parents. In terms of travel, there are problems. You are not allowed to request a new passport for uh, your child when you are the third or fourth uh, parent. Uh, you're not allowed to take the child across the border to another country. And especially in a situation of a conflict like what Didi was mentioning uh, in the introduction, um, you could even run the risk of being accused of child's abduction if you take the child across the border without permission or of the first or second parent. In terms of finances, there are uh, difficulties. For instance, a child has to pay more taxes when the child inherits, inherits from the third or fourth parent. In, um, and that's different from when it inherits from the first or second parent. So in taxes, there is still a difference that needs to be solved. And a third or fourth parent is not allowed to open a savings bank account for the child formally. Um, and last uh, example I would like to give is uh, when the legal parents die, for instance, in a car accident, the first and second parent die, the third and fourth parent who are also raising uh, the child they do not get automatically uh, a legal parenthood, but it's a court, a judge, who has to decide what's the best interest of the child. And of course, one can assume uh, it would be to grant legal parenthood to the third and fourth parent, but um, there are uh, cases when there are conflicts in families that grandparents, for instance, say, no, we, now want to have legal parenthood and then you know there's this uh, whole difficult thing in a court case uh, now to try to fix these problems i just mentioned a few of the main problems uh, that third or fourth parents um, are confronted with um, the dutch parliament uh, asked the government to install a state commission on what they call modern family law. And the State Commission was um, uh, installed in 2016. In 2017, they came with a report. And in their report, they have a few suggestions for the government and for uh, the Dutch parliament how to uh, renew Dutch family legislation. And I would like to um, mention a few uh, of these examples, but before I start, I'm looking at Michael and I'm asking Michael, how much time do I have left? I don't hear you. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, I think you can finish the examples you're about to give us and we can move to the question. Yes. Okay, so I will make it relatively short. Um, the state committee, and it's a very important uh, commission, uh, they said every uh, legislation that we are about to introduce 
should be viewed in the best interest of the child. So it shouldn't be an emancipatory uh, movement. No, uh, we are looking what is best for a child, a child that's being raised by multiple parents, for instance. And from that perspective, we are proposing some changes. One, will, one the, the most important change, I would say, would be that biological uh, par parental descent should be on equal footing, intentional parenthood. So um, the biological parent and the parent who wants to raise the child, but who's not the biological parent, they, they should have the same rights in relation to the child. If there are more than two parents, for instance, a gay couple raising a child with a lesbian couple or one lesbian mother, uh, they could all three or four become the legal parent of the child, uh, but under uh, the condition that all four parents, so the gay couple and the lesbian couple, they should agree and have their agreement documented. If there is not such an agreement, uh, there can be no multi-parenthood, according to this proposal by the Dutch State Commission. And the agreement must be made before the child is born. So uh, it requires a lot of, let's say, um, a knowledge of the future parents when they uh, decide to uh, make a child and to bring a child into the world. They must realize that they have to arrange a lot of things uh, before the child is born. And they have to, their arrangements have to be documented in a contract. And the contract should be approved by a judge. So it's, it's a serious business. Uh, if you uh, want to have a child raised by two couples, for instance, you really have to think and plan ahead and go to the court and get approval. This all according to the suggestions of the uh, Dutch uh, committee. And a hotly debated topic, uh, and I noticed this already, you know, that's a reality on the ground. If uh, a child is born in such a combination, um, one of the most hotly debated topics is which last name will the child get? Because um, usually all the parents want their last name to give to the child. And so that's complicated. And so the state commission proposes that the parents before the child is born have to choose one last name. And if other children are born in this combination, all children will have the same last name uh, as they chose for the first child. And uh, it should be documented. Um, and that's of course uh, complicated. Uh, so it's very important that future parents will have good solid information by the government what to do if you want to bring a child into the world into such a relationship. So um, and let me now conclude by saying that um, the Dutch State Commission but also we as members of parliament we are always in close contact with Dutch NGOs uh, with civil society because of course that's where the personal stories take place like Didi's story and her problems. And they are very important for us as members of parliament to listen to these personalized stories and to think how can we come up with uh, solutions. So in, a Dutch, in the Dutch democracy, it really works well that politicians, the government, the state commission, members of parliament work together with um, national uh, NGOs in order to solve these problems. I would like to say that um, in Dutch democracy, it's very important if you have a vision, if you know what you want, if you want to solve these problems, um, yeah, you have to try to make your dreams come true. Sometimes it works, sometimes you win, and of course, uh, in politics, sometimes you lose. That's all uh, part of the game. But we should always remember 
that the future is not in front of us, but the future is inside of us. And each one of us can make his or her dreams come true. Thank you very much. question is about registered partnership and then marriage. Um, what I try to explain is that because nowhere in the world same-sex marriage existed uh, in the 90s um, and because there was a lot of opposition against my idea when I proposed it in Parliament, I thought it would be cleverer first to start with registered partnership and that's what we did. People got used to registered partnership and then the step towards full equal marriage rights, exactly the same rights as to opposite uh, partners or to same sex partners can have, uh, that step was easier to take. Um, and there is not so much difference in terms of legal consequences uh, between registered partnership and uh, marriage. So in our Dutch system, we have registered partnership. You can choose if you, if you don't want to get married. It's open to same-sex couples, but also to opposite-sex couples. So everybody uh, can choose that, or you can choose uh, marriage. It's also open to opposite and same-sex couples. Once you have chosen registered partnership, it sometimes happens that people after a few years say, actually, we want to get married. And then it's very simple to change your registered partnership into an official marriage. Um, so uh, there are hardly any problems uh, with uh, those two. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the registered partnership is more popular on their uh, opposite sex couples than same sex couples. So same-sex couples, when they want to officially, uh, their relationship being recognized, they prefer to go to a marriage to, um, to marry. Uh, and opposite-sex couples uh, tend to go to registered partnership, which is interesting. Uh, in terms of the rights towards children, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, adoption is in a separate law granted to single parents, but also to uh, couples. And it doesn't make a difference if it's uh, two men, two women, or a man and a woman. But we have to understand that um, there are only maybe two, 300 children per year who are born in the Netherlands who are up for adoption. Most adoption cases are uh, children born in China, for instance, or Colombia or Brazil, who are adopted by Dutch parents and have to come uh, to the Netherlands. And of course, it's the adoption authority in the country of origin who can decide whether they want to give their child up for adoption to a gay couple or a lesbian couple. Sometimes there are countries abroad who say, no, 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 no. We don't want two men or two women to raise a child that is born in our country. And so um, there is no Dutch jurisdiction, of course, over such an adoption authority in a country of origin. So uh, in terms of reproduction rights, um, there is no discrimination against, let's say, uh, lesbian women they have the same rights uh, in order to get sperm donations, for instance, from a sperm bank or uh, IVF procedure. There is no difference between uh, a, married, a woman married to a man or, for instance, married to another woman. In the beginning, the Dutch LGBT community was not in favor of my proposal. Uh, to introduce same-sex marriage because they said we have a different lifestyle and our lifestyle is different from heterosexuals, heterosexual couples. So why would we uh, imitate them? Uh, 
um, just focus on other issues. Um, but of course, in society, and also in my book, uh, and this one chapter has been translated, um, there were uh, lots of gay couples and lesbian couples who do uh, did want to get uh, marriage rights, equal marriage rights. And so um, you could actually see a difference that in society, people came to me and said, please uh, go forward and try to uh, achieve uh, same-sex marriage while the board of the LGBT uh, group, NGO, said, no, we don't want it. And so there was a discussion within the NGO community, uh, in the NGO, and uh, then the board uh, was changed and younger people uh, were elected in the board of the LGBT group. And they said, yes, we do want marriage rights because we want to be treated equally like everybody else and then once there is same-sex marriage we can always say we don't want to get married but we must have the same choice as others and in this process i work together with role models so i noticed that michael in his introduction mentioned a famous singer uh, in china who was gay and who died on the first of april um, so for me, at the time, 25 years ago, 1995, 1996, when this was uh, really debated in society and parliament, I looked for role models, and it could be scientists, it could be lawyers, it could be parents and friends of LGBT people, it could be actors or singers or sports people. And I asked several of them, and some of them were straight allies, they were heterosexual, but they thought it would be important to have equal marriage rights for LGBT people. And so I asked them to speak up and to join forces. And together with those allies, it really became a movement and everybody was talking about it in the 90s. And so a lot of people who didn't really care about uh, same-sex marriage, they thought, well, but what I do care about is that LGBT people are treated equally without discrimination, also not discriminatory laws should uh, be there. And so that had been uh, very important uh, for the public discourse to have straight allies supporting uh, the case of same-sex marriage. Thank you, Boris. Um, as we said, prior to this event, we're very glad to have a translate Boris memoir into Chinese. Um, we thank Hewei Ziyou, Libertarius Digest Helan for this work, and translator Xiaodan, Zhang Zha, and Susi for their work to translate their, uh, this chapter into Chinese. It's a very good book, and uh, we have already circulated the link of this translation of today's work. Uh, since Boris needs to be leaving us uh, soon, I want to ask if there is any final question from Professor Yang to Boris um, for his remarks. Yang teacher, Yang teacher, you have some questions to give Boris. Professor Yang, do you have any question for Boris? Because Boris has to leave earlier for another meeting. Uh, no question from me. And thanks a lot for, to Boris for his sharing. Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Boris. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, hopefully, we can really have you physically with us in mainland China and also in Hong Kong in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris. Bye bye. Well, this would be the conclusion of our first session, and thanks a lot to Boris. In our second session, we will focus on the situation in China. Boris mentioned that in the promotion of the rights of LGBT, L, uh, NGO plays a very important role. And according to Didi's story, we can see that there are a lot of room for us to improve in the relevant rights and interests. And uh, I like to give floor 
to a lawyer, Dong Xiaoying, who's the advocate for Diverse Family Network. So yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. So my name is Dong Xiaoying. I'm from Advocates for Diverse Family Network. As Michael introduced, we focus on the rights of singles and the lesbians and their reproductive rights and the relevant status. And I will introduce the situation of the relevant communities. And thanks a lot for the invitation from the University of Hong Kong. I will share my screen with you. The first part is about the lesbians. You know that lesbians are forced to be single. And their reproductive rights are not protected by the same-sex marriage because we didn't have the relevant rules of same-sex marriage. And you know, in China, the reproductive rights are related to the marriage. And because in China, we didn't have the relevant recognition about same-sex marriage, their reproductive rights are not protected. And in 2016, we had the relevant research and found several difficulties. First is about the difficulty of pregnancy, according to the rules and laws from Ministry of Health. It's prohibited to help the single women or other people who are not recognized by the law. As a result, the reproductive rights of singles and lesbians are not protected. And you know that the prohibition of implementation of human reproductive technology, including the sperm bank or the IVF and so on, are prohibited. And uh, in 2003, the Ministry of Health had the Code of Practice for Assisted Human Reproductive Techniques. It mentioned that the artificial assisted reproductive technology is a way or is a treatment for infertility instead of a resort for the singles or the lesbians. And uh, there are a lot of discussion about reproductive rights. And uh, in the two sessions this year, there are several proposals about uh, the promotion of reproductive rights for singles. And maybe in the future, we could see some lights in this regard. Those lesbians in the future may be entitled to using those technologies to get pregnant. And uh, we've made some research and survey for the sperm banks across the country. By the year of 2019, the 23 sperm banks, they cannot provide sperm application services for single women, but for a woman, if you want to get married or get pregnant, you need to have the sperm. So in China, you couldn't realize the pregnancy through the sperm donation. Uh, you can just go outside the country, like Didi, they went to the US. And uh, there's a special case in Jilin province in 2004, it said that uh, women who have reached the legal age of marriage and decide not to marry and have no children can adopt legally medical assisted reproductive technology to give birth to a child. This is a good news for the singles and uh, the relevant group. We went to the to four hospitals with IVF service. But you know that back in 2016, the application was denied because they claimed that the applicant was not married, she was a single lady, so they denied her application. So though there's the relevant rules in place, actually the hospitals or the institutions still denied such application. Because you know that our country does not encourage the pregnancy at single state. And in 2018, we have the 
advocacy during the NPC and the CPPCC, you know, Jilin province is actually very advanced in the relevant uh, regulation. And uh, we hope that this kind of cases could be advocated and expanded. And at that time, the relevant authority gave some response for single women to get married. There should be five prerequisites. First, the household registration is within the province. Second, they have no kids. Third, they decided not to marry in the lifetime or they have got, got married and decided not to get married again. Fourth, it's out of their own willingness. Fifth, they have no relevant uh, diseases in reproduction. We've done a lot to promote the relevant legislation. So the regulations are there, but it's not fully used. And uh, even the single women got pregnant and gave birth to a baby, there will be difficulties after they, their children were born. First of all, is the children's household registration problem. Second is about the alimony or the social maintenance fee. The, the law promulgated that the relevant fee should be paid, but in practice, it's not actually implemented. The third is about our theme today. It's about the parental rights because the partnership or the marriage were not recognized by the law. Child can only have one legal parent-child relationship with one mother. And the fourth difficulty is about maternity insurance. Those single mothers, they couldn't enjoy the equal maternity insurance. But there are two exceptions in Guangdong and Shanghai. They have some openings in the law about the maternity for single mother or the lesbian mother. And the fifth is about the difficulties in employment, especially for those who are in public public sectors, they may be dismiss, dismissed or get some disciplined punishment and so on. And also about the question on parental rights, we believe in part that who gave birth to the baby will be the mother for the baby. But now sometimes the kids may be registered in the name of the other one in the couple. And the second is about our preliminary sharing of community survey results. In two months from August to October in 2020, we have 2,900 valid questionnaires for the lesbians or the relevant community, we actually made some survey about their reproductive rights and about 59.2% of the people had the plan or had already planned to live with a same-sex partner in China and they did not legally marry another opposite sex. You can see that the number is quite high, standing at 638. And also 185 or 73.4 people hope to have sperm through foreign legal artificial assisted reproductive technology, like the practice by Didi and her partner. You know that in China, it's not legal. So they went, they chose to go abroad. And about the reproduction of the delivery, usually they will have the oven from A and B will be the one who got pregnant. So about 30% of the people chose to have this method. 
that all this kind of practice would resort to artificial assisted reproductive technology. And in China, you know that it's very strict and uh, you couldn't implement this technology. So you need to go abroad to have the relevant help. But in China, after you return to China, sometimes the status wouldn't be recognized. And also we asked question about the difficulties in during their pregnancy and before and after the childbirth. Actually, there are a lot of difficulties. About 20% of the people couldn't enjoy the maternity insurance, which is quite important for them. You know that for lesbian couple, even though uh, you are not going outside of the box on it's actually a very great burden for you without the insurance and also some discrimination or prejudice from the employment is also a very large difficulty and uh, also the sperm donor they couldn't uh, totally be separated from the kids and uh, it's also a problem for the lesbian couple so in china even though you succeed to get a donor sperm donor or you married uh, an opposite sex it's also a difficulty for them to have a very clear relationship and a lot of people they are not worried about certain kind of things we thought is a problem and also about the female reproductive rights a lot of person we asked whether they are willing to resort to the relevant legal activities like the intended guardianship entrusted guardianship and so on if you look at the child rights 71 percent of them are totally willing to do something to protect their own rights and uh, during our survey we found that some of them already made their effort and we are also spreading the story to tell this group of people that they can have some choice. And the third is about case sharing. So sorry, we are running out of time. And the third is a case study is about the open from A and B is the one who got pregnancy. And you know that they got the technology in China and gave birth to a pigeon pair, but it's in violation of the law in China. So there's no relevant evidence. And after they break up, one wants to get the custody of the kids but it's very difficult for her because there's no evidence and the court wouldn't claim it as a case so there's no option but to give up it's really a pity and also about uh, some of the prospects for the reproductive technologies in China during the NPC and the CPPCC. Actually, a member of the CPPCC mentioned that we need to loosen some restriction in this regard so as to guarantee the reproductive rights of single women in China. That's a conclusion of my sharing. Thank you. So thanks a lot to Xiaoying and your sharing about the, the, the advocate in the diversified family network and uh, we've witnessed uh, your practice and the efforts in the promotion of the relevant rights and the next i'd like to give floor to professor yang professor yang is from china's Renmin university of china the law from the law school and the adjunct professor at national prosecutors college and uh, he is also the trial team leader of the civil division of the Supreme People's Court, and uh, he is involved in the drafting and amendment of many laws, including the contract law, the pro property law, the tort liability law, and the civil code. And uh, today, Professor Yang will share with us on the theme, respecting the dignity of children born with artificial assisted reproductive technology. The floor is yours, Professor Yang. So good evening, everyone. It's, re it's really a great honor for me to be here and to be invited by the University of Hong Kong. I believe it's a very good platform, but because of the pandemic, I couldn't go to Hong Kong University in person. Otherwise, it would be better. 
And then my topic is quite broad, maybe. Mm, I will talk about the theme, as you can see on my slides, about uh, the rights of the children born by the LGBT group. I'd like to share with you about my ideas from three aspects. First is about the legislation part. You know that, the, strictly speaking, there's no relevant legislation about the rights and interests of LGBT people, but we mentioned about the topic. For example, in the amendment of the marriage law, a lot of people actually mentioned the legalization of the same-sex marriage, but the relevant authority at that time thought that it's, it was not the time for our country to have the relevant law. But we can see that there are a lot of discussion in society about this topic. And in legislation, just few people have put up with this. And uh, I'm actually an experts in the drafting of law of the NPC. After I proposed the relevant idea, it was not re responded in a very active way. And about the cohabitation, also the relevant legislation party doesn't think it's a good time for us to consider the relevant rules and regulations. So in legislation, we are making some effort, but uh, without very good results. Maybe it will still a long way for us to become a country like Netherlands, which recognize the rights and interests of same-sex couples. And for me, during the discussion, I thought that maybe we can talk about the rules and regulations about the same sex partners then we can talk about the same sex marriage after same sex cup um, partner is recognized or accepted by the society but anyway currently the legislation authorities are not in support. And uh, second, when we are talking about LGBT, about lesbian or gay, some people may wonder this is a kind of disease and they want to fix this kind of situation. Actually, several years ago, a court in Haitian district accepted a case. At that time, It was mentioned that in Chengdu, there's a clinic or an institution which provided treatment for gay or lesbian. And uh, that LGBT guy went there to get the treatment. And then he collected the evidence and uh, filed a case to the court because the WHO has already made it clear that LGBT or lesbian or gay is not a disease and you shouldn't try to fix this. And the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Health and the Family Planning also mentioned that lesbian and gay is not a kind of disease and there should be no treatment for this kind of situation. And uh, during the judgment for that case, we have collected some advice and we also wrote several articles so that we can have more protections for the gender minorities or the LGBT group. And uh, the court at that time claimed that this kind of treatment is a kind of tort of, or the violation of human rights. But though it's a violation of rights, there will be no compensation. And uh, as for the website, which gave the advertisement for that institution, is also was also not punished. 
So you can see that in this case, part of the judgment was quite advanced and the part was still very conventional. And uh, in our society, back in that time, the protection of the rights and interests of sex minorities is not a focus. And uh, what I want to emphasize is the third part. It's about the children born with the relevant technology by the same-sex couple. What kind of parental relationship will they be in? Previous speaker mentioned that the ovary is from A and the B is the one who gives birth to the baby and who should be defined as the mother. This is actually a problem. As the moderator said, my topic is to respect the dignity of children born with artificial assisted reproductive technology. And uh, originally, I wanted to share with you about the children born by a surrogacy. How can we make sure that their dignity is respected from the moment they were born? So maybe I can talk about the surrogacy baby in the final part of my presentation. Here's a case in Xiamen, and in this case, it, the plaintiff and the defendant were two women. They lived together, and uh, one provided the oven, and they bought the sperm, and then they have the embryo transfer, and they got a baby. They actually reached some agreement or consensus, but later, there's some there are some issues and uh, they were fighting for the custody of the kid and uh, there's some dispute over who is the mother for the kid and uh, the one who gave birth to the baby actually hid did the baby and uh, the one who provided the oven actually went to court and uh, the court believe that in terms of the mother-child relationship, the principle is that the one who gave birth to the baby should be deemed as the mother of the baby. So the mother who provides the oven is not deemed as the mother. So it's just uh, the result of the first trial and it was now during the second trial and uh, there's no conclusion up to now. I think that in this case, we need to consider several elements. First of all, no matter the children or the kid is born by surrogacy or was born by a same-sex couple, In mainland China, no matter the law recognizes the status or not, one thing is for sure. As long as the kid is born, his or her legal position or status should be recognized so that their dignity is respected and uh, the kid will not be discriminated in his or her lifetime. This is the case in Xiamen. And also we have another case about the status of a kid born by a surrogacy in Shanghai. 
And in this case, the man and the woman were remarried to each other, and uh, they were infertile, but they really wanted to have a kid, and uh, they actually resort to surrogacy. And uh, the husband provided a sperm. And they bought ovum from another male, uh, another female, and then they entrusted a surrogacy, and the surrogated woman gave birth to a pigeon pair. But after that, the husband was died from a car accident, and uh, the wife was supporting and uh, bring up the kids. But the parent-in-law or the parents of the husband actually mentioned that the wife didn't provide oven and uh, she has no relationship with the kids. And they tried to get the custody of the pigeon pair, pigeon pair from the mother and uh, they went to court. And according to the court, the judge believed that though the mother didn't provide oven, nor got pregnancy, nor gave birth to the baby, still she should be deemed as a stepmother to the kids. But I have some doubts about the judgment because the couple actually reached consensus to have the surrogacy. So this is born within the marriage. It shouldn't be deemed as a step child or step children. If the pigeon pair were deemed as step children, their dignity or their legal status would be changed and their dignity would be like impaired so the stepchildren are entitled to the relevant rights and obligations from their parents. Still, I believe their positions or the legal status would be different as they were deemed as a stepchild. So I believe that this kind of judgment about the legal position of children born in surrogacy would impair the status or the dignity. And the children born by same sex couple, when we judge who is the mother, should also based on the biological relationship. When we are talking about these cases, we need to remember that in the 1990s, the Supreme Court once had the interpretation about a rule. It's about the legal status about children born with IVF or the artificial fertilization. If a husband is infertile and uh, the couple gave birth to a kid through IVF, how should the parental relationship be defined? Actually, there are also three situations. First, the husband, the sperm is health, and uh, he used his own sperm through IVF. Then there will be no distribution. And uh, the other situation is that the sperm is not active enough, and it should be combined with other sperms to have artificial fertilization. Then the relationship of the kids with the father is not very clear. And the third, the husband is totally infertile and uh, 
the couple resort to a third party's firm to give birth to a kid. And at that time, according to the judicial interpretation, it mentioned that after research, we believe that while a spousal relationship subsists, both parties agree to undergo artificial insemination and the child born should be regarded as the legitimate child of the couple. So the rights and obligations between parents and the child shall be governed by the relevant provisions of marriage law. I believe this is very reasonable. And I think this regulation could be applied to the kids born by the by born in surrogacy about their status about their relationship with their parents and also when the wife had some problem and uh, the couple went or the couple resort to surrogacy, there are also three different cases or situations. We can also resort to the judicial interpretation of the Supreme Court to define the legal status of the children. So we didn't have very clear rules and regulations in place, but we can resort to the judicial interpretation by the Supreme Court. So as far as I am concerned, be it child born by a same-sex couple or born in surrogacy, when it comes to their legal status, we need to consider the several key points. First, it's about the civil code of China in the article 1002. It mentioned that we need to ch cherish the value of life dignity. And the life dignity is about the safety of life and the dignity of life. Now we are talking about the dignity of the children born with the relevant technology. And uh, the life dignity in the past were not discussed a lot. But nowadays, we believe that life dignity is very substantial. So the dignity and the safety of life should be protected. And the dignity includes the dignity of life and death. In the article wrote by me and my student, we mentioned that the dignity of death is of great importance for people. People is entitled to resorting to hospice. And uh, they can resort to hospice care and other means to protect their dignity of death. And about the kids born in surrogacy and uh, through the reproductive technology, we need to focus on the dignity of life. Because you know, in terms of dignity of death, people can take the initiative, they can make the choice, but about the dignity of life, the kid has no ability at the very beginning to safeguard his or her own dignity. So it's up to the parents, it's up to the society to help them, to protect them. That's why we need to have the relevant rules and laws in place and the institutions and the society should provide the help 
Otherwise, the dignity of life of these children would be impaired. And in their whole lifetime, they will bear the burden from their birth. This is not what we like to see in a civilized society. And the case I mentioned in Shanghai, the court deemed the kids born in surrogacy as stepchildren. I don't think they are showing respect for the dignity of life of those kids born in surrogacy. So no matter it's born from surrogacy or through artificial fertilization or born by the same sex couple, in the recognition of their legal status, we need, we have to make sure that their dignity of life is protected and guaranteed. And as Professor Boris from Netherlands mentioned the principle in the recognition of the league of the children born by the Rams technology is that it should be most conducive to safeguarding the interests of children. The children's interests should be maximized. That's the prerequisite. This should be the principle guiding us in the recognition of the legal status of children born with the artificial or assistant reproductive technology. So I want to reiterate again. The interests of children born by surrogacy or the artificial assisted reproductive technology should be protected and maximized. And, uh, in recognizing the legal status, it not only from the technological view we need to make sure that their dignity is respected. And uh, in realizing this end, I believe that there will be three ways, three choices. First is like the case in Xiamen, which means that the Woman who gave birth to the kid should be deemed as the mother. Twenty or thirty years ago, maybe we didn't have the relevant technology to realize the reproduction. Then this principle has no problem, but now we have new technologies. We not only have IVF, but also have some surrogacy in other countries. Under such circumstances, the principle that the woman who gave birth to the kid should be deemed as mother will be controversial. And uh, the second judgment phase is that the mother-child relationship is determined by blood relationship. Means who provides the oven should be deemed as the mother. Traditionally speaking, the principle 
that the woman who gave birth to the baby should be deemed as mother is actually the same as the principle based on who gave the oven should be deemed as a mother because several decades ago technology was different and uh, the blood ship blood relationship and uh, the delivery couldn't be separated but now things have changed and besides the blood relationship and childbirth relationship i believe that we can have a third way the one who make decision to have the IVF should be deemed as a mother or father. In the judicial interpretation, it mentioned that even though the kid has no blood relationship or biological relationship with the parents, Yet, the parents decided to have a kid during their marriage. Then the kid would be deemed as a legalized kid during the marriage. In the case in Xiamen, I mentioned the result to the principle of child delivery relationship. And the, the case in Shanghai resorted to the blood relationship, but both ways have some loops. So I believe that the third way the parental children will be the best. If we want to protect the dignity of these kids born by the technology, I believe that we need to resort to the third way, as I mentioned, in the parental children. And here I like also to say something about the children born by same-sex couple who resort to artificial assisted reproductive technology. For the lesbians, they can provide their own oven and they can get pregnant by themselves. They can choose to get pregnancy and give birth to kids through the artificial assisted reproductive technology. But for a gay couple, things would be totally different because they have to resort to others. What they can do is just provide a sperm. The oven, the pregnancy and delivery are all done by others because they have no abilities in this regard. And then things would be very complicated for the gay couple. Maybe in the sh short run, in our country, it's very difficult to legalize the same-sex couple or same-sex partners. Though the lesbians and the gays are not legalized couple, 
they can resort to other means like the story shared by Didi and the other speakers, they can actually go to other countries to have IVF and other ways to have their own kids. So though in China, same sex couple is not recognized or legalized, we need to, we have to recognize the legal status of kids born in surrogacy or through IVF by those same-sex couple, we need to make sure that their dignity of life is guaranteed and their interests are protected. As I mentioned before, the couple or the partner who decided to have the kid should be deemed as the parent of that kid. So we have talked about uh, cases like A provides the oven and the B got pregnant and gave birth to the kid. And for the gay couple, they resorted to a third party or resorted to surrogates. No matter what the case is, as long as it's the couple's common decision to give birth to the kid, the kid is should be deemed as their kid and they should be deemed as the parents of the kid. Only by doing so can we protect the dignity of life and maximize the interests of those kids. And uh, in their whole lifetime, their dignity will not be impaired because of the source of their birth. I believe this is the message I want to deliver today. I talked about the kids born with artificial assisted reproductive technology for normal couple and the same sex couple. So any dispute over the status of children born with the technology shouldn't impair their interests and rights and the dignity of their life. So Professor Yang, thank you for your excellent sharing. You actually reminded me of the time back in university when I attended your lecture. We can feel your passion and the knowledge in the relevant field. And time is really limited. So I like to give floor to the teachers and the professors. Whether do you have any question for Professor Yang? And uh, Professor Yang talked about uh, the topics about uh, the legal status of the kids born with IVF and other technology. And uh, the University of Hong Kong will have the relevant series of lectures and seminars. So if you are interested in the topic, you can actually fill in the questionnaire. And uh, then we will send you the review of today's lecture and the information about the future lecture to you. So the lawyers and the professors and teachers attending today's meeting. If you have any question, you can raise your hand or you can actually type your question in the chatting box. And uh, I believe Professor Yang would be more than willing to answer. Uh, we have a question from a lawyer named Tiger. You can unmute yourself and uh, raise the question. So if you couldn't make yourself heard, you can type your question in the chatting box. Uh, thank you, Professor Yang, for your sharing. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks again, Professor Yang. Uh, uh, lawyer Zhao from Shijiazhuang. Mm, can we actually write an article about your ideas and topics in our website or in our official account? Uh, after you write the article, you can send it to me for review. Do we have any other questions from other professor or teachers? Uh, 
卢老师也是王竹的师妹。哦，哦 ，Miss Luo， you can actually directly ask the question. So your name is Luo Ming, right? Yeah, it's me. Hi, Professor Yang. Maybe my question is not in close relate, closely relevant to your sharing. I believe your sharing is from the perspective of laws and rules, and my question maybe is more down to us. Mm, actually, mm, when in the opening, Didi shared her story. There's some dispute about the kids, and、uh, some would actually hide the kids. It's not just in Didi's case. I recently came across a case. One of the parents actually hide the kids before they have a final judgment from the court. So, what would be the essence of the nature of this kind of practice? So I like to ask for your advice or experience in this regard. So actually, this kind of practice is not limited to the same-sex couple. Even for the normal couple, when they are fighting for the custody of kids, some of them will resort to hiding the kids. When I was still in the Supreme Court as a deputy team leader, I actually came across a case. The couple were in Beijing, and、uh, then they got divorced. And、uh, the wife actually brought 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 the kids to Hebei province. And、uh, the couple actually reached an agreement that if one party got remarried again, the kid should be under the custody of the other party. And、uh, the wife actually got remarried, and、uh, she took away the kids. And、uh, the wife,、uh, the husband, actually went to get back the kid. So, hiding the kids or taking away the kids from the wife or the husband is quite common. If one party take away the kid by force, this kind of practice could be deemed. As a tort action, or as an infringe infringement act. And for a same-sex couple, no matter how they gave birth to the kid. I don't agree with the judgment in the Xiamen case. The kid should be deemed as the kid of both the parents, and both the parents are entitled to custody. If one of them hides the kid and prevents the other from visiting the kid. It should also be deemed as a kind of infringement action. Some people may want may wonder that the couple is not legalized. How can their action be deemed as infringement? But actually, As long as the same married couple made a decision, made a common decision to give birth to a kid, like 
they are the first or second parent of that kid as the uh, professor from Netherlands mentioned and they have the parental right and uh, if one actually prevented the other from visiting the kid it's a violation of the parental right of the other I believe we can solve this kind of practice and uh, the judge should be neutral enough in the judgment of such cases so thank you professor yang do we have any other question from other teachers and professors if no question from professors i'd like to ask a question from other audience there are maybe three questions related to your topic so professor yang the first question is about uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the couple made a decision it the decision should be made before or after the pregnancy or delivery and the second is the, if the surrogacy is also the ovens provider and uh, she changed her idea she want to keep the children by herself so then what would be the situation and also do you believe that the parental right of the same sex couple would be more advancing than the protection of the same sex marriage And uh, you mentioned that the interest of the kid should be maximized. Can this kind of principle be guaranteed? I think the answers to these questions will be very complicated. Maybe each can be expanded into a thesis. So I'd like to give you a brief answer from my experience first is about the agreement or consensus made by the couple no matter it's uh, the gay couple or lesbian couple or a normal couple when they decided to have a kid with artificial assisted reproductive technology they have to reach this kind of consensus and I believe the timeline should be before the pregnancy. They first they have the idea, they reach the common decision, then they will go to the practice to have the kid with artificial assisted reproductive technology. And if the couple didn't reach consensus and one result to the surrogacy, the other was not on the table, then the problem will be quite complicated so the timeline line i believe should be before they went to the pro uh, surrogacy and uh, the second problem provided the oven and do the surrogacy and want to keep the child by herself it's actually like it's actually not surrogacy again it's a kid it's just a kid born by herself so i don't believe this would be a real case this wouldn't be the case in surrogacy otherwise the legal status recognition of legal status of the children or the kid would be even more complicated so we couldn't jump to a conclusion for the second question and about the third question
啊，就是他们之间没有。So、the kid and the parent has no blood relationship, then will be there any parental right? I believe that we didn't have the relevant rules and regulations in marriage law, and there were some shortcomings in marriage law. The marriage law focuses more on marriage itself instead of the relationship. And the civil law in China for a long time didn't recognize such rights as conjugal rights and so on. And in the amendment of the civil code, there are two articles or provisions. In the Code for Civil Rights, it mentioned about the civil rights based on marriage. The new amendment is actually about the identity rights or the rights of personal status. I believe that this is a great advance in the civil code or the civil law in China because in the past we didn't talk about identity rights, but now we have very clear definition of the relevant interpretation about the identity rights. And the identity rights, as I mentioned, including uh, include the parental rights and the conjugal rights and so on. And for the heterosex couple, things are not so complicated, but for the same sex couple, their rights are not recognized. So I believe that the parental rights could be recognized before the conjugal rights. You know, for a single mother, she is, of course, entitled to the parental rights with her kid. And let's review the case in Xiamen. In that case, the court actually excluded the parental rights of the person who provided the oven, which is unacceptable. So in that case, though they are a lesbian couple, after they gave birth to a kid, we need to adhere to the principle of maximizing the interest of the kid. And the kid should be deemed as a kid of both of them and uh, both of the two ladies are the two ladies are entitled to the parental rights to that kid and for a gay couple and uh, if the gay couple had a kid one provided a sperm and they went to a third party for surrogacy and can we say that the one who didn't provide the sperm are, is not entitled to parental rights? I don't think so. Both of the gay couple are entitled to the parental rights. So, you know, for one man, he provides sperm and uh, bought a uh, an oven and went to a third party to surrogacy. This man 
is also entitled to the parental rights to the kid. I'm not sure if I answer the third question. I believe that the parental rights could be guaranteed. So thank you, Professor Yang, for your sharing. I believe you have answered the question very well. And uh, now it's already 9.30. I think that we can have one last question. A student from the law school from a U.S. university, it means that uh, the student actually got up very early in the morning. And uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, you actually proposed uh, the rights to protect the LGBT or the sex minority, but uh, it wasn't uh, responded very actively. So what was the reason behind that? As I am an expert in the drafting of relevant laws, and I'm engaged in the drafting and amendment of civil code, I have my experience. And uh, for the legislation or the amendment of the marriage and family, I've always put forward with a topic about same-sex marriage or same-sex couples' rights and interests. But in some official scenarios or in the process of legislation, it's not put forward very formally. I really want to facilitate the legislation of the relevant rules and regulations about six same-sex couples. But the legislation authorities, they are not very active in this regard. So we didn't have the relevant judicial interpretation about same-sex marriage and couples in the marriage law. So I don't think it's a good time and uh, scenario for us to dwell on the topic. So thank you for your answering. I hope that in the future we can have more comprehensive and in-depth discussion about this question.